We're live and we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. But I have Dr. James Tabor joining me. How you doing, Dr. Tabor? I'm doing great. I know that we've had some controversy from this course. Quite a few people didn't like some of the things that were mentioned in uh, in its presentation, but you point out clearly that you kind of get what you get when you're reading Mark as Mark and not filtering it through the other gospels. So you're going to be doing a Q and a for anyone who signed up for the course and can still sign up for the course to be able to come and join you for a private zoom group, get together Q and a tell us about right. the course. Tell us about the Q and a what, what you got coming up. Yeah, well, We're doing this live on Thursday and the Q and a is on Sunday, the 30th, the last day of the month, just before, Monday, May 1st, so not quite May Day, and it's at noon Eastern time. You have to pick a time. I know it cuts some people out globally, depending on whether they're willing to set their alarm clocks, but basically that's it, and I'll send the, we'll send the Zoom invitation out by email. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I guess I didn't know to go live. We need to edit this. <laughs> uh, send the Zoom invitation out or, or Ryan will, your faithful companion, Ryan. It'll come from Myth Vision, so be sure you don't have Myth Vision going to spam. I'm sure nobody who listens to you, Derek, would certainly do that with your emails. And and also, uh, we'll, we'll put the Zoom link also on the web course page, so if you log into the course, you can't find the email. That happens with me all the time. Where's that email with the link? Right. Yeah, you can just go to the course, and it'll be there. And uh, I've already got the questions. People have been sending them in. It goes all the way back to some of the questions when you and I did it on March 5th. And I'm sure we can't cover them all, but because I've got them ahead of time, I've organized them. And not right now, but one of the things I'm going to do is tantalize you a little bit towards the end of our session today. I'm going to give you a couple of the questions that mm -hmm. are just like, wow, how are you going to answer this? And I'm not going to answer them. I'm just going to kind of tantalize you and say, okay. uh, I'm going to I'm going to address these. So so there's that. Now, you sent me a. Um, a video link to a young man. Oh, we won't mention his name now, but uh, he had objected to the methods. He had three objections to the methods I use, mm -hmm. not the methodology. I always tell my students, talk about methods. Methodology is the study of method. But I'm talking about the actual method I use. Uh, like John Crossan has a method. Dale Allison has a method. Paula Fridgetson has a method. Uh, on and on. Bart Ehrman has a method. How do you approach these documents? What are your presuppositions? What are your ideas? Uh, and everything from being accused of, oh, you just pick and choose. And this particular gentleman, and, and you know, I, I have nothing at all against him. In fact, I want to do a show with you where we'll play some clips, not to like put him down or anything, but he raises really good good points that people you have to understand the method I'm using with these gospels, which I I call careful. Some people call it critical. I call it careful. So when I teach Mark, forget the others even exist. Now, along the way, I point out, now notice what Matthew does with this. He just takes it out and Luke just takes it out and so forth. I'm assuming these guys are conscious, right? They're not zombies. And so when they look at Mark in front of them and they have other traditions, okay, yes, of course they do. And they want to add them. But sometimes they want to add them because they don't like the point Mark's making. Like, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Luke just takes that out. Now that's conscious. How do I know it's conscious? Am I in his head? Yes. How am I in Luke's head? Because I've compared every single time in Mark uh, when Peter's mentioned and how he treats Peter. And so that's how I know. In other words, I'm being careful. I'm not just shooting from the hip like, uh, oh, Tabor likes this. And he says, this is in and this is out and this is up and this is down. That's not how I work. And if I did work like that, please, you know, do more critiques 
but I always welcome critiques. You know, I want to do a show with you in the future, Derek. I've been writing this down four or five ways that I've changed my mind on things, which I hope is to my credit. You know, if I've been studying this stuff and teaching it for four decades, I hope I've changed on something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, could I use my notes from the 70s and, not, you know, here's my notes for the Mark course. Uh, you know, I, I keep uh, adapting and adopting and learning and so forth. So as much as the content, I want to show people the way many of us study and how we go about. Uh, another thing we can do, and this isn't a course, Derek, but it kind of, I really want to do this method thing for all of your people. It's just so important. And, and what we could do in the future, too, is talk about how my method is, say, different from Bart Ehrman or Dale Allison, mm -hmm. and then why, or, or Crossan, naming some of the major people that have written on Jesus. And then why, and that's why we come out with different conclusions, you see? Is that, well, you guys can't agree on anything. Well, let's figure out why we can't, what their presuppositions, you know, Bob. Well, I wouldn't Price say you I, can't agree on anything. The, the, I think no, we overall, for the most part, you do agree. Yeah. yeah. But you know how people say, oh, those scholars, they think they've got it all down. They're reading it historically and they don't even well, agree. Is there an empty tomb? Is there not an empty tomb? Right, term? right, right. Or, this and that, but so well, the problem with that is I find some of the more conservative types that are arguing this, they'll say stuff like, well, the documentary hypothesis and the supplementary hypothesis and these, they can't agree on anything. And it's like, actually, I've spoken to both sides. They do agree that there are multiple sources from different voices that are taking place. The one thing they do agree on is that this is not one author writing all of this material as if they're all saying the same thing. So that's right. the thing the conservative approach is trying to do is say, Hey, kind of like the conservative approach of the gospels is to try and say, these gospels ain't so different. In fact, yeah. they're actually the same kind of voice. Even that's if they're right. different people, they're pretty much saying the same thing. That's yeah. what they want to sell you. Whereas you all are in agreement. No, these are different voices, but our conclusions are a little different. I just want to emphasize that. And and it isn't, you know, I did a pretty radical title once with you that Matthew and Luke hate Mark, and it was partly clickbait, I admit it, but we talked about that. Why are you and, telling And us? I said, well, hate is hate is like love less, according to a lot of people when they read the Gospels, like hate your mother, father, brother, sister. So they love him less. How about that? If you can relax with that. But what happens is they, the approach often is, well, but they have other information that they add. And aren't we glad that we have this additional material? Well, of course I'm glad. But I also want to read what the result of adding that material is or taking mm -hmm. something out that's really significant. Like a really good example, and I'm going to actually address this in the Q&A, but I want to answer it now. Mark says, there'll be no sign given to this generation. No sign. Matthew says, except the sign of Jonah. Okay, if you put them together, go, oh, well, I want all of it. And he obviously said, there'll be no sign except, and poor Mark, he just didn't know the exception. And so he left it out. Okay, if if you think that, then you're reading the gospels in a certain way. I would encourage you and I encourage my students uh, to be aware of that if you want to finally put them all together and get it all. But what you've got now is something you've created. And what if Mark is doing something with that? No sign. And I think he is. Mm -hmm. It's when he literally turns on his heels and walks away from this particular group that is dogging him. And, and he never talks to them again until the last day of his life. And then he blows them away and he basically says, I'm done. You know, so Mark is making this point about who can hear and who have who has ears to hear and people being blinded and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you got to read it carefully. But anyway, we're going to do this great Q&A. Uh, I, I wrote down a couple of things. Son of man is used 14 times in Mark. Son of God is used three times, but if you take out the first one, 
the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, which many major manuscripts don't have, then it's two times. Wow. Now, I didn't emphasize this in the course, but people are going, well, if, if, you, if you say Mark thinks Jesus is a God, he's the son of God, right? But if you don't put it in verse one, and it only occurs two other times, and I'm not even going to tell you the other two times. I want you to think about it, because off the top of your head, you might come up with one or two, but there are only two. Now, that's notable. That is very notable. Now, you go count Matthew and Luke and where those occur, and you're going to see something emerging, okay? And if you mush it all together, guess what? You've lost Mark. See, I, I want to preserve Mark. And if you add to Mark or take from Mark, let's go to this old evangelical, you shall not add to or take from, right? That's right. in Deuteronomy 4, and it's at the end of the book of Revelation. So what do they do? They add to and take from. So all of a sudden, Mark is not Mark. So I'm the fundamentalist. Thank you. Because, <laughs> no, I, I'm not adding I know, you're taking from. Please put that label on my head. Tabor just goes with the text. He doesn't fool around. I'm not trying to synthesize or harmonize. Right. Now, if they're contradictions or differences, which they are, that's, I would then read Matthew as Matthew and Luke as Luke and John as John. And then you can begin to talk about given all of, and I would also throw on the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Peter, uh, maybe the gospel of Mary Magdalene and some other things. And then begin to talk about what is, you know, a hundred years after Jesus, say around the year 130, right? Bar Kokhba. What is a, what are all the things that we know? You'd have to have the apostolic fathers in there, you know, and so forth. But before Justin Martyr, which it becomes really synthesized then, I think. So it's a whole enterprise. Uh, like my teacher, Robert Grant, wrote a book called From Augustus to Constantine. Best book on church history ever written, bar none. You know what his footnotes are? Hmm. All of his footnotes primary sources this is how dr grant worked you know he didn't care what joe blow said even if it's a good scholar you know who scholars always think i gotta get i gotta review the 25 interpretations of why there's no sign of jonah no i don't i'd rather just look at the text you know so anyway so we're going to talk about that well what does son of man mean if it's used 14 times is he talking in Mark? No, this is only in Mark. Is he? Does he mean himself? Like Pontius Pilate asked him, "Are you the Messiah?" Straight out, Mark. I think it's fourteen, chapter fourteen. Are you the Messiah? Straight out. He says, "I am," and you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Very interesting, you know this thing about the Son of Man. Uh, it's a Daniel thing, as you probably know. I know you know that, but many don't. And, and it's odd. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. A lot of people, and Bart's doing a series on this now. So isn't this kind of interesting, this sort of uh, uh, serendipitous uh, thing that, uh, about the young man who runs around naked and they're asking me, these are questions I've gotten for Sunday, what do you think of secret, Mark? Well, believe me, I knew Morton Smith well. I'm talking about a friend. He read my dissertation before it was done. I have annotations. I should bring them to the meeting if I can uh, pick them up, find them in a box stored away. Mm -hmm. But but I can show you pages of my type dissertation, Morton Smith's writing. And he told me when he sent it back to me, he said, I hope you're sitting down when you get this. And I go, that was on the phone. And I thought, oh, is it bad? He goes, no, I just wrote on every page. <laughs> you know, so uh, this is Morton Smith. And no, he did not forge that uh, document. Now, what the document is, you know, can, we can talk about. Won't have time to do much. We should do a course on, you know, esoteric gospel fragments or something sometime. But not right now. Uh, another one is... Uh, one guy wrote me just this last week. He goes, could you tell us in your own words very clearly what is the secret of the kingdom in Mark? Now, 
should we clickbait this and say James Tabor will reveal the secret of the kingdom and Mark on Sunday at noon or shortly thereafter in a Zoom meeting? You should. Are you going to actually I, tell everybody? Because in the I course, think you, I might, but it's I want them to figure it out in the course, and I don't want to spoil it. It's sort of like a spoiler alert, right? You know, if you've been watching Succession, you know that Logan died. You know, and you go, oh, oh God, I wasn't supposed to say that. Sorry. <laughs> well, they're already on episode five or six now, but some people are watching Succession. It's like, you remember Homeland when Brady died? They hung him. The Iranians hung him. I don't know if you ever I, watched. Them. I never watched. These them. are HBO shows, Derek. They're not. They're not like Netflix shows. So anyway, okay, okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Mark and Q is a big question people are asking me. I want to talk about that because one idea would be Mark. There's Q, like say, let's call it sayings of Jesus and the story. You know, that's the two source theory, and they get put together with other stuff by Matthew and Luke and John. But what if he does no cue but doesn't like it, Mark? I want to talk a little bit about that on Sunday. In other words, should we just assume that he loved Q and he thought, oh, Q, the collection of the sayings of Jesus, the material that Matthew and Luke has in common, he loved that stuff, but he didn't need to tell the story. But wait a minute, there's stuff in Q that's pretty damn amazing that would fit in Mark really well. Is Why doesn't he like use a little bit of it maybe? A couple of times there's some parallels. but So we're going to cover all these things. It's going to be interesting. And I'm telling you, Derek, and I'm not just bragging, you know, for effect here. These these students that, that I've been hearing from, and the ones, you know, we met March 5th, we had over 200 people and you did the MC on the questions. And now I'm going to do it myself because you're, you're out of town, but I'm going to, I've got them all written down and we're going to go a couple hours, but you know, these people dig deep. Uh, I, I don't know all the places they're coming from, but this is our YouTube world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I am so impressed not impressed with everyone who comments on our YouTube channels because some of them are just rude and yeah. just want to use our platform to, you know, preach their message. Or some of them are kind of, frankly, sound kind of crazy or something or tell that, <laughs> the, you know, they're a redemptive figure. And if we would listen to them. But in all those comments, think of all the comments we get. And you get this in your super chats. We get stuff from people that know more than I do. Mm -hmm. about a thing they've been delving into and you know we'll probably have some today like that so i don't know it all but i'm telling you we're gonna have fun and i i can't tell you what a pleasure it is to have a zoom meeting with a few hundred people that have read the stuff studied the stuff and they want to come and now talk about it I, w I just wish it could be live you know we talked about running a big arena somewhere <laughs> and having like a YouTube convention for biblical studies and all right. the main hosts could be there and each of them could speak. Maybe we could get some scholars to come and it would be kind of like hang out. You'd be the guy to organize that. So right. I, no, really, you know, and people would have to fly in and we would get some good hotel rates and who, you know, we could have a two or three hundred convention of uh doing biblical studies wouldn't that be fun i'd love it and we could like have fist fights and wrestling matches intellectually <laughs> <laughs> have the scholars kind of go back and forth uh, on stage yeah. or something um there's so many things that you also have coming up before we get to super chats and get distracted in the weeds um which i i love doing you have some courses. So first thing I want to just emphasize for those who are watching right now, the one we did with Mark, that one's out. You literally, I pinned the comment. If you're interested in signing up, you can join Dr. Tabor. I won't be there this Sunday. It's Sunday, isn't it, James? Yeah. No, we haven't given the link yet, but you're going to give the... Well, yeah. I've already given the course link, so they could sign up for the course. But as far as oh, the yeah. email going out for the Zoom, that's not been released. And it'll yet. also be on the course uh mm -hmm. if if you lost the email like we said yeah or if okay. you don't make it someday. yeah so it's not too late this is thursday you know you don't have to have completed the course just come and 
you know, sit in the Zoom meeting and 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 it's not a webinar. Uh, we could do a webinar where I don't see you and you see me. And I, I personally, even though it's little thumbnails all over the place, you can put it on speaker view when I talk and we'll record it. And if you can't make it, we, we're going to upload or whether you make it or not, people like to listen again sometimes or review yeah. things that they didn't get or they had to go to the bathroom or get some coffee or tea or got called by or their dog barked or whatever. <laughs> so you're not going to miss anything if, even if you step away. Sometimes the internet goes out and you go, damn, right when he asked that question, he did that question, my internet went out. So so all of that, all of it will be recorded. So unless my internet goes out, we're good. Yeah. Uh, so you already have the the seven lectures uh, that goes through the entire Gospel of Mark, and we already have the Q and A from the first session. It's on the course, so if people yeah. sign up, they can go watch the Q and A. They the can first watch one. that, and, and then and, they get this second one. We might down the road do a third, but I think in the meantime, we'll be focusing on doing three more courses. Can you tease us about what? Oh boy, we'll can I? I can. The what? The first one I want to do is called the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Jesus Movement. I want to really work on that. Now, let me show you two, two things here. This is the book. It's Gaze of Vermesh, V-E-R-M-E-S. Don't try to Google it because it's totally out of print. This is the first edition of Vermesh, 1973. I bought this in graduate school, 73. Do the math. Wow. 50 years ago am i right <laughs> and i was a young guy in my 20s going to grad school uh getting my doctorate and this was my copy of the dead sea scrolls you can see it's a little yellow but guess what even 50 years ago before all the new scrolls were out in the full corpus of scrolls i think i've got somewhere the current book i don't need to pull it out but it's about this thick it's over 800 pages but just from these basic documents that were available even in the 1950s, I'm going to teach the course. I don't mean I won't look at any of the new stuff. I even published some of it myself for the first time, uh, some of the new texts. And, and we'll look at some. But I'm talking about the community rule, the Damascus document, the war scroll, uh, which is a, the apocalyptic book the thanksgiving hymns uh bible interpretation the peshers these are commentaries on books like habakkuk and so on this is 50 years ago you could study and i'm telling you most of the main ideas you can get from about seven texts so we can't do 800 pages of dead sea scrolls but when you take this new course the dead sea scrolls and the jesus movement not only are you going to be able to say something intelligent about, you know, would Jesus have ever gone to Qumran or would he have picked up on some of the ideas of the so-called Essenes and were they Essenes and so forth. We'll do all of that. I'm going to recommend certain books, including the latest edition of this, which you should have. It's in paperback. It's cheap. And other books that are not required for the course. There's the only thing required for the course is you have to have access to reading the Dead Sea Scrolls. But some of that you can even get online. But, uh, you know, I'm going to recommend that you buy this one paperback book, which is the Dead Sea Scrolls in English. I mean, if you're taking a course on the Dead Sea Scrolls and you go, well, I don't really want to own them, it might not be the course for you. You know, it'd be like you're taking Mark. I don't really want to read Mark. I just want to hear Tabor talk. Well, again. We want to delve in and you're going to love it. It's it's a college course that I teach. It, it's pretty high level stuff, but don't be scared away. It's, it, it's so interesting. Look, repeat after me. Apocalyptic, new covenant, prepare the way in the wilderness, messianic, baptism for forgiveness of sins, all things in common. Uh prayers for sacrifice the temple's a den of thieves who am i describing there the jesus movement or the dead sea Scroll? <laughs> both <laughs> now right. you go oh so you're saying they're different i mean every dead sea scroll scholar says don't think jesus is in the scrolls don't think you know 
Don't go with Isaac and so forth. Well, Jesus isn't in the scrolls, in my opinion. Neither is James. But what we have is this precious collection of documents hidden in caves for almost 2,000 years that were discovered, 1947 on. And you might not be aware that Dead Sea Scrolls were found before that. Hmm. Uh, in the time of Origen, the church father, who's third century, late second, early third, scrolls were found, guess what? In caves, in jars, out by Jericho. And Origen's all excited about it. Some Remember, just he, came to mind, though, Dr. Tabor, like, I think this course will be the perfect one for me to use footage we took when we were there in Qumran. Oh, yeah. Oh, so this absolutely. will work perfectly with oh, that. Oh, you can put in, when I'm talking about, you know, Cave 4 is the mother load cave, and you can zoom in. Even I know you got really good shots even zooming in into the cave. Right. And then you guys went up and walked in some of these caves. Cave 11, yeah. So we'll add... Man, we, we'll work on this. We'll add supplements. I mean, you're going to be able to hear me talk about the latrines that I discovered there. <laughs> that are scarcely for going, life. Yeah, why is going to the toilet such a big deal? You know, and uh, because you got to go outside the camp, but you can't go outside the camp on the Sabbath because you're not allowed to walk more than a thousand cubits, and yet the toilets are 2,000. So, what are you going to do? I'm not going to tell you now, but in the course. So we'll do all that. The other one I want to do is Apocalypticism Through the Ages. This is the second course. Man, it, it this is what I specialize in. I mean, I specialize in Paul. You got this but, written down, right? But apoc Apocalypticism Through the Ages. I want to take four or five apocalyptic movements. I'm going to quickly hit the Dead Sea Scroll movement and the Jesus movement. Now, I know when I hit the Jesus movement, we're talking Mark 13. All of your beloved former brethren in the Preterist movement will be like, well, that didn't fail. Okay, we, <laughs> we can hit that a little bit. But I really want to go on. I want to do the Montanus, and it, that's in Asia Minor, into the second century. I want to pick up with what people think Augustine and some of the church fathers. They're all settled down in the world. And the church is going to go on, and the church is the kingdom. These guys are all calculating stuff from Daniel. Did you know this has gone on now for 2,000 years? Actually, if you throw in Daniel, 2,200 years. People have been uh, counting times and how many days of this and that. And then we'll get up into the Middle Ages, and then we'll do uh, the Enlightenment and how people begin to think... Uh, we have to be on the cusp and we'll get into the modern world. And I'm even going to end with Waco and David Koresh, who's a very interesting figure that I've studied a lot. And many of the people who've looked at my channel and my blog know we just had the anniversary last week, the 30th anniversary. So that course is going to be good. Apocalypse, apocalypticism through the age. And I think we're going to call it perils pitfalls and rewards in other words there's some there's some pitfalls there's some perils uh but also why would you even study apocalypse if it's just a failed idea why even study it like does it have any cultural value today other than going look at these idiots they missed it again i think it does i actually think <laughs> it's powerful symbols it's the kind of thing that crossing gets into right and it, the last lecture, I think we're going to have to have 10 for this course, not seven, because it, it's going to be pretty in-depth. But the last uh, the last one will be on the relevance of apocalyptic. A lot of people write in comments uh, on this Waco stuff. Come on, you know, who cares about all this stuff? Not the government attacking the Branch Davidians and all that, but like all these ideas of prophecy, they've always been wrong. Throw the Bible in the trash. What a waste of time to even think about it. Well, then why do you have a channel that's getting near 100,000 subscribers? You say, well, you're just knocking the Bible. No, you're not. You're doing all kinds of things with the Bible. Yeah. You have people on that believe the Bible on some level. Top scholars like Dale Ellison is my favorite. 
And and I think even Don Crossan says he's a Christian, right? I think he identifies yeah. as one. Yeah. Bart doesn't, but and I don't. I don't take those labels, but I, I like being a human being. It's kind of fun. But anyway, <laughs> that's my label. Tabor's a homo sapien. That's right. what I am. That's my label. But anyway, I, I wanna, you know, we're gonna do that. And let me show you this, because I want to do archaeology. This is back to the Qumran, not apocalyptic, but it's kind of apocalyptic. This is a piece of pottery from Qumran. I got to find out where my camera is. There you go. Looks like a doggy treat. Can you smell <laughs> it? Can you smell it? I, 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 hold on. I smell it. Oh my gosh. I smell it's, it through the microphone. It's burnt. It's burnt. That's burnt pottery from Qumran. And it's, see, can you tell it was the lip of a kind of a little jar? Right. So this was burnt in the year 60, uh, I'm sorry, 67. It would be the summer of 70 it was burnt as the 10th Legion came down on their way to Masada. And I just, you know, this, the, I didn't steal this or anything. They're all over the place. But it's from the, it, it's a first century jar. And I'm also going to talk about the sons of light and the sons of darkness lots and according to Qumran God God's like this for you Derek let's see I'm gonna see where you come out right now okay I'm gonna pick one of these you tell me you want pick the right or left hand what do you want <laughs> you just showed it to me do it again because I saw it well I'm trying I, to get I don't want to cheat you know I'm gonna go with the left my Which, left hand uh, this one sure let's do that one sure with the wedding band I can't see it I'm a son of darkness. I knew it. <laughs> but guess what? Everybody has 10 lots. So I need, I don't have 10 here. According so to Kumran, you times. have 10 lots and you get five. Possibly light, five darkness. You could have, I don't know, in your case, Derek, you could have nine dark and one <laughs> light. Nobody is all dark. Like chances are when you go like this cosmically, you're going to get, and that will account for all the varieties of people. These guys believe that. Did you know they did phrenology too? Everybody I love the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're so great. And what do you think of the bumps on your head? Because that's going to give your character according oh. to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we're going to get into everything. It's amazing stuff. And I love it. That's awesome. I love it. It's crazy and it's good. It's bad. It's ugly. It's wonderful. It's all. <laughs> so. so the third course, we're not really sure yet exactly where we're going to go with that. I want to do a gospel though. I think we okay. should return. You know, we've done Mark and I think we should do either Matthew rewriting Mark or Luke rewriting Mark, or I'm actually thinking of John because everybody thinks, oh, John, you know, Mark's early. John hasn't got attention, and there's whole. I'm part of a seminar at the Society of Biblical Literature. We've been meeting for years now. Uh, I call it the rehabilitation of the Gospel of John as a historical source. And I would like to look at John again and show you the parts of John and unpack it. it it's, it's the favorite gospel of Christians through the ages. Probably because the Greek is about like a third grade level, <laughs> you know, like light, darkness, good, evil, you know, big words like that. Uh, walk, <laughs> do. <laughs> but uh, within that is, is a framework and other material. And, you know, everybody says, oh, John, he's the one that really does the divinity, divinity of Christ. Listen to this, John 17, Jesus prayer that they may know you, the only true God, talking to the Father, the only true God, that's a very Shema thing, you know, Shema Yisrael, mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And everybody, oh, but it's pre-existent in, in John. Well, we'll, you know, if we do John, I think I'm leaning towards John. John's understudied by by people that get into the academic study of early Christianity. Not not scholars. You know, every all of us have to look into John. So I'm thinking we'll do one of the gospels. Okay. So those three, we're gonna record them in June. I'm gonna come out and visit you for a week and we'll record those and have a lot of fun. And uh 
I'll get the studio set up too because I plan on making some changes in here and how I have it set up. But we'll, we'll and make... you can drink root beer and I'll drink Sam Adams, and the courses are just going to get better and better. <laughs> Every beer later, the course. I like better. Sam Adams. I'm a Boston Lager guy, so yeah. Okay. Well, I got some super chats. Do you want to jump to that? Yeah, let's do it. Why not? Yeah. Okay. All right. I uh, really appreciate the support, everybody. Mnag in the house. Really appreciate the super sticker. Didn't see a question or comment. Just showing love on the first one there. Appreciate you. Doc Pleroma not is back. Is Mark openly discrediting Peter? The parable of the sower as failed discipleship denying Jesus, demoting him by calling him Simon, etc. Pretty sure 16.9 originally said, Peter, now go home and get your tackle box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, and this is a good question in light of using the, the patristic, the patristic mm -hmm. story that this is Peter's companion or Peter's scribe. And it's like, would peter be saying like would this would a scribe be saying this about peter it, it's tough to imagine that but anyway yeah it, it touches on quite a few things that uh one that does go directly to one of the questions i'll i'll address on sunday okay uh, an aspect of that and actually two things i see in doc's question that we'll touch on um the whole Papias thing about uh, Mark is an interpreter of Peter and he recorded things as best he could, uh, you know, almost like how he heard it. It's almost like he, rem you know, like he's remembering it or something. And he might not have got the order right because Luke kind of says, I'm going to get the order right. But actually, Luke, that word uh, that you translated in order, can also mean accurately and most people want it to be order like oh it just moves some things around but luke doesn't move much thing you know if you look at a column of stories in mark and how luke incorporates them they're pretty well he, he doesn't have a big problem with the order he adds he folds in his things but so basically um that that little quote it's from eusebius who's a fourth century historian who's quoting papius we have these fragments from papius and then my favorite thing about that whole passage is eusebius says but papius wasn't a very bright guy you know he he, yeah. he, he, didn't, he didn't have much perception of stuff and the reason is he doesn't like his uh, millennialism papius oh. is waiting to like have vines yielding gallons of one grape will yield like five bottles of wine and so forth. He's picturing the millennium, you know, very materially. And Eusebius is like, no, no, the, the church is the kingdom. We're already in the, you know, there's no reign of Christ on earth. Are you kidding? Earth? The earth is like negative, you know, to these dualistic people later. Poor Papias, he's like, man, I just thought it's going to be great. We're going to eat and drink and you know, had peace and justice on the earth, and it'll be like fun to be here. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk about some of that. So no, he's not an interpreter of Peter, for sure. But that's not what Doc's asking. Is he openly discrediting Peter? Yes, but as a symbol of the disciple who doesn't get it. In other words, Mark, in my view, is, uh, and I present this in the course quite a bit, he wants you to enter into the experience of hearing Jesus, hearing the explanations Jesus gets, so that you're. it's kind of like putting you on in the exam room when you read Mark, because you've got to pass at the end, and I've got to ask you, well, what is the secret of the kingdom then, Derek? And, you know, it's kind of like a final exam question. And if you say, well, man, it's all these buildings will finally become ours and we'll sit on thrones ruling and reigning forever and we'll have all power and glory, then a buzzer will go, beep, wrong, you know. So Peter, in a way, stands for all of us, I think. Uh, Mark, it's difficult to, you know, some people have said about my course, 
Well, you present it like it's a drama or a play that he just made it up. It has these motif, these literary motifs. Well, that's because it's skillfully written. He didn't just say, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. I got a few ideas here. Or, Here's what really happened, and I'm just going to write no, it out. He, he, no, he's not doing that. He's setting you up. He's got the basic story in mind, the rejected suffering servant who brings redemption to the world. Okay, that's his basic core. And then he's going to tell you the story of how he got basically smashed and crushed and utterly defeated. And then you get the climax. Surely this was the son of God when he's dead, forsaken by God. Well, Peter, at, right before that, has denied him the night before three times. That's Mark's story. Nobody can take that story out. I mean, you you just can't do it. There's certain story like the Gospels move things around. But some things you cannot take out that are in Mark. I mean, you know, you can edit a little bit here and there, but. And, and Peter's failure in denying Jesus three times. But you've got to look at the circumstances of that in the passion narrative, as it's called, and realize that he's basically every man, every woman. If anyone would follow is basically the line of work. Now, it ends with, and I'm not going to reveal this right now, sorry, but the young man running away when Jesus is arrested and it says, and they all forsook him and fled. And then it tells you about a guy who fled and was naked, right? Boy, what do you do with a weird story like that? You could just say, well, you know, there's a guy there with no underclothes on and he ran away naked. Somebody grabbed his garment. Oh, really? Is that what we're getting here? Just a little historical update on streaking in the garden? Or is there something more here? And I think there is something more, and uh, we'll talk about that on Sunday. Let me see what else he says. Uh, I don't know if sixteen nine said that, Doc, but I do know God, that would. It, I do know that the Gospel of Peter, which is very very similar to Mark, the last chapter that we have. Uh, in fact, I've got it right here. I always like to read it and not just paraphrase it because it's so cool. Uh, you know, it breaks off. I stuck it in my uh, at the last page of Mark in my Bible where I would always have it. Let's see if it's here. I think it's here. Yep. Hey, listen to this. This is uh, just a little fragment of the Gospel of Peter at the end. It says, uh, the woman fled from the tomb frightened. That's verse 57 of the last chapter. Now, it was the final day of unleavened bread. The FBI during Waco didn't know that Passover lasts eight days, right? So David Kors said, I'm going to come out after Passover. And they checked their Jewish calendar. They weren't Jewish for the most part. You know, they're good old boys in the FBI. I'm not saying they're no Jews, but it wasn't the culture. And they go like, well, pa according to the Jews, I checked with a rabbi. Passover was last night. And he said he would come out after Passover. So he'll come out tomorrow. But Passover is eight days. Because you have seven days of unleavened bread plus the Passover evening. So it was the final day of unleavened bread. Now, how do I? That is seven days after Jesus, the tomb is found empty. Seven days later, and the women have fled. Listen to this. This To me, this is the most mind-blowing text in early Christianity. And many went out returning to their homes since the feast was over. Now, it doesn't just mean people, but in general, you go home when the feast is over. Sukkot lasts eight days. You go, And if you come early, it's a Day of Atonement, or actually Rosh Hashanah, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and so forth. Uh, but we 12 disciples of the Lord, notice he says 12, not 11. Isn't that interesting? We 12 disciples of the Lord. Because, you know, Judas shouldn't be there. And I don't think he is. I think they've appointed somebody already. We're weeping and sorrowful. And each one sorrowful because of what had come to pass. Wait a minute. <laughs> Derek, what has come to pass in the past week since the empty tomb? Appearances of Jesus. Talking to him. Seeing him. Guys on the road meeting him. Eating with him. Him saying, touch my wounds. 
So why are we weeping and sorrowful? Because of what has come to pass, we departed to home. And I, Peter, and my brother Andrew, having taken our nets, went off to the sea. And there was with us Levi of Alphaeus, whom the Lord, and then it breaks off. So this is not the ending of Mark. I think Mark ends just like it ends. Mark leaves you at the empty tomb. But Peter picks it up, first the Gospel of Peter, and says they went back to Galilee in despair. They lost their best friend. They lost their leader. They, they lost the Messiah, the dead Messiah. What are we going to do? We all ran away. We didn't take up a cross and follow like we were supposed to. And if Mark had continued, I think he would have the recovery of faith in the Galilee. How do I know? Because he tells, Mark does say, the young man in the tomb, not an angel, a young man, says, go to the Galilee, you will see him as he said. Okay? Hmm. And Matthew says there's a mountain they go to that he told them to go to. Now, whether Mark knows that or not, I don't know, but Matthew seems to know it. So, um, I don't know if that completely... Uh, Calling him Simon, yeah, right. Simon, if Peter means the rock, then he's not much of a rock anymore, is he? <laughs> so, Kephas. I, I also uh, think there's probably a play on the words having Simon um, from Cyrene carry the cross where Jesus, or uh, but Simon Peter doesn't carry that cross that he was supposed to carry. So there might be some like playful things happening in this, which is making me also go, this literally happened. I mean, there's more reasons for me to think that they're being a little bit fanciful with the writing um, in Mark than to take it verbatim historically what actually occurred and stuff like that. So, right. I but actually I will remind you opens. that I will remind you that uh, the ossuary of Simon of Cyrene and his son Alexander, not Rufus, but Alexander, two sons, mentioned only by Mark. Mm -hmm. That has been discovered, and it's at Hebrew University in the lab there. And we weren't able. If you and I go back on a private tour, I can take you to all these things that are kind of hidden away. You can't do it with groups. Yeah. But we can go look at Masada stuff that's in the, in, in the museum, not the public museum, but in the archives. We can, we can go see some of these ossuaries. They're in the basement of the Israel Museum and so forth. So now you're talking. Yeah. Now you're talking. You the know inside me. stuff. Imnag is back with an actual uh, statement here. I would love a convention. I would fully support it as well. I believe it's something people need to hear. I think it'd be great. I don't. You know, I don't know how many scholars we could get to come. I would come, but uh, a lot of times scholars, you know, want all their expenses paid and they want honorariums to do things. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm such a great guy, but I would come just to hang out with everybody because I think it would be fun. But if we did have a bunch of the main YouTube hosts come together yeah, and then have panels and things where we all hash these things out, It'd kind of be like a YouTube ancient ancient religion type gathering. That'd I think awesome. it would be very cool. And you could do it cheaply that way, where people basically need to come up with where to stay, Airbnb, get a group rate on hotels, and you need a meeting room. And then you just need people to voluntarily come. And I think all the YouTube hosts would come because they're going to sign people up for their channels and get oh, yeah. to talk to people that are their donors. So there's all sorts of stuff. That well, think do. about it. I think it would be very cool. And then you could have a few very key topics for people to talk about, you know, yeah, yeah. some ancient Near East, some scientific, some early Christian Dead Sea Scrolls and so on. Heck yeah. Good, good idea. And Imnag, I'm not like, that is stuff we will be doing. I'm fairly confident it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when and where well, you guys um, have created a phenomena out there. I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah. And it is hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. that are, you know, everybody doesn't always subscribe. I mean, I can tell by my views, I only have 30,000 subscribers, which I'm certainly happy for. 
but then I've got videos that have 600,000 views and people are watching for longer than three seconds. So, you know, you, Derek, are impacting, well, several million people for sure. And a lot of them have really studied. That's what I like. Mm -hmm. They're not just, you know, like a water spider going over the water. Oh, that's interesting, Derek. Oh, there's David. No, they're more like, wait a minute. We're going swimming. Listen to these <laughs> scholars that he's brought in, these top scholars. And Neil's doing it and other people are doing it uh, that you're associated with. And I'm a latecomer to the party, but I like it. You're an early. You're early to the yeah, party. Yeah, but you're my you, new. You're my new classroom. You know, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I used to have fifty people in a class, and now I have like thousands. So. Yes. Listen. Yes. That's that's the goal. That's yeah. the goal. I mean, Steve Mason made a a wonderful remark that was inspiring for me. The very first interview we did after seven days, he wrote me an email, and Steve does not write small emails. Steve. Steve writes emails and He's I'm like, so okay, amazing. Oh, he is, he is. So, so I open it up and he, he wrote this fantastic inspirational email to me that was just thorough. And it, he said, I have more people wanted voluntarily to click and watch me talk for three and a half hours or how, he goes on, right? He's very thorough and takes his time. And I love that about him meticulous. And he said, more people watched this in seven days than I've ever taught in the 17 years while I was a professor. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing is, they're more prepared than our students. I hate to slam the students. But basically, I had some, like we talk about our mutual friend, Ryan, that hooked you and I up and introduced yeah. us. I mean, you know, I always had two or three dozen like him that have taken a lot of courses really delving in. But the vast majority of class of 50, half of them are like, when's the test? What's going to be on it? What's the grade? But a few are going, man, I want to figure out early Christianity. Tabor taught, you know, he does archaeology, does history. I want to travel with them. I want to go to a dig. So there was a minority. But with YouTube, I can just tell by the emails I get and my Patreon people and so forth. They're, they're in it seriously. Like they really, and even if they're not, bible believers anymore yeah. which many of them once were it's still important culturally to try to look back and see where you've come and and you know what you were taught growing up and where you are now and also for our culture to be able to talk intelligently about these great cultural ideas mm -hmm. that are the pillars of our whole civilization you know whether it's the Ten Commandments or Moses or the Bible or the prophets or Jesus or Paul or whatever, and yeah, I just uploaded today a two-hour uh, video on Paul. You go, God, Tabor, you've talked about Paul so much uh, on my uh, yeah. There it is, right there. Uh, two-hour video on Paul uh, with Christopher Enoch. And he lets me talk, you know, basically he just like runs the camera for me and he's very good, very good. And I, I like, I like, uh, he kind of eggs me along in a nice way, but basically I just blabber, 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 blabber about Paul. But I called it, what do we really know? Because we did a lot on method, you know, like what, like there are four Pauls. I think you know that Derek, there are four Pauls. If you read my book, Paul and Jesus. So which Paul are you talking about? They said, well, he's on the road to Damascus, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, where do you read that? That's only in the book of Acts, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's actually four layers of Paul you have to distinguish. So what do we really know? And should we trust the letters? And did somebody named, uh, what, Piso write them or something like that? You get all kinds of these things out there. There is. Anyway, but, you know, we have people who will listen for two hours I had somebody write me and said, I walk every day for an hour and a half to two hours. So please put up two hour videos so that I can just like, you know, do my exercise thing and listen because you can listen to mine. Usually, you know, you don't have to watch me and my face. Right. Move. You can just listen. And I think half the people are listening because they're doing the dishes or they're changing a baby or they're driving or they're walking or exercising or even at work uh, when it gets boring and the boss isn't around 
you know, stick those earphones in. Act like I get a lot of people like that that watch us while they're at work. They're probably yeah. having to sneak back and forth. But <laughs> yeah, oh, we got one more super chat. I just want to hit this. And I do want to show the course just to tease people a little. And yeah, I hope people understand. will come yeah, and sign up. Yeah. So Dr. Romana says swoon alert. Why is Mark inconsistent when Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate to take down Jesus's Soma from the cross while Pilate agrees to allow his, what is this, Toma? Potoma and Soma. It's two different scary. words. Yeah. Pre-planned resuscitation efforts with medical spices? <laughs> Hugh Schoenfeld, 1960s, the Passover plot. But it's actually a theory that Schweitzer covers in the quest for the historical Jesus. It's called the swoon theory that Jesus, uh, he knew that he had to suffer, but he, he didn't want to die. It, I mean, you could present it several ways, but this would be the sincere guy. So he wants to suffer to the point of death, like Jonah. Like if you read Jonah, he enters the belly of the fish, which is called Sheol. So the gates of Sheol he says, are closing on me. So that's Jesus on the cross. But at the last moment, the gates open and he gets to come out. So it is an idea that people have suggested. It certainly accounts for the empty tomb because he would have uh, revived. And uh, some have him traveling to Kashmir uh, and Senegar. There's a grave of Jesus. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to do this with you sometime. I've got nine tombs of Jesus now. I keep getting more. Nine tombs of Jesus. There's one in Japan. There's one in India. There are three or four in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, most I people, one in my backyard, too. Uh, well, these are serious, though. And there's one up in the, <laughs> the one up in Galilee. I think I'm the only one who's ever discovered it or been there. But it's a rabbinic description of uh, the tomb of Yeshua ben Hanotsri, Jesus the Nazarene, in the Galilee, outside Sfat which is Safed in English, uh, just, just north of the, the Sea of Galilee. And it, it's in my book, one. The Jesus Dynasty. Yeah, No, we didn't go there. You and me went to one, though, that we got like practically kicked out of. Yeah, but this is now, uh, this is a tomb of, for, this is Isaac ben Luria, the Ari. Okay. The most respected mystical Jew in history who says, I visit the tomb of Yeshua Hanotsri and I pray there because he's one of the righteous ones. So here you have a Jewish rabbi calling Yeshua a tzaddik, a righteous one. Mm -hmm. And what does that do for, for this idea that people have that, you know, Jesus was cursed by all Jewish groups. And so here's a mystical Jewish group that is actually visiting his grave in the Galilee. At least they think it's his grave. Right. That's it. That's in my book, The Jesus Dynasty. I have a picture of me at the grave. Hmm. I should uh, take, I, usually we can't do it with tours. It's kind of hard to get to, but there are so many things we can do, Derek. Yeah. Yeah. Doc, so, thank you for that. Like, really appreciate the super chat and the fun. You're always fun and witty. Um, oh, Christine Elise uh, sent a super chat too. I love the long videos. Thank you guys. Great, Christine. I'm glad you like the long videos. That's and great. we have like people at work, by the way, um, at work, uh, <laughs> the working right now. I'm at work. I'm calling your boss. Hold on. I hope I'll... these aren't the people that Microsoft and everybody's laying off by the thousands. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, let me. And, let they, me... and they go, we, we've noticed no change in productivity since we fired those 40,000 people. Mid Vision like... and James Tabor allows you to multitask so you can keep your, mm -hmm. keep your job. Here is the inside of the course that we have so far on Mark. And it's he has a lot written here you get the pdfs um it's an, you can just listen to it and look audio. at that you map can... now those map that is a map we have made for the course look at that. right well wow. mm -hmm. there's maps um we go obviously reading recommendations where you go in and you give sources that you recommend people to do here is a, the first live q a session that we already did so people can actually go listen to that 
Boy, Lecture. Ryan is doing such a good job with this layout. This is so professional. I she really it. did an amazing job. And you go in depth. I mean, this is fun. It's an experience you get to go through. Um, there's seven lectures. Just showing everybody. And then as you go, you'll see your progress. It tells you what percentage you've taken the course and stuff. Um, and then and you get study, Sunday, study notes and everything. Yeah. Right. This Sunday, you're doing a live Zoom Q&A for the people who've signed up for the course. I've pinned that in the comments in case you haven't already done that. And if you miss it this Sunday, in terms of being there live, we are going to make it just like this one, where it's going to be recorded, and it will be up in the course for you, so you can check it out. We're doing three more courses, just to tease everybody. We have three more coming with uh, James, and we're going to go deep into those, so be on the lookout for that. Oh, did I share... Hold on. Did I share the, oh, you can go to the website, mvp-courses.com. I have other courses we just launched yesterday, which hasn't even, we haven't updated the website. Here's the one, Creating Jesus, Why Mark's Gospel Was Forgotten with Dr. Tabor. The one we just launched yesterday was with uh, Dr. Kip Davis on real Israelite religions, like plural, because there's different voices in the material evidence and and what's going Man, on there? I don't know how you do all that you do, Derek. And I'm not just trying to flatter you here. My God, it's like editing all these courses and it's amazing. I and just, every, every time I pick up my phone, you have another damn notification of a video. I can't keep up. You know? <laughs> and I'm not watching the shorts. I'm talking about the regular stuff you put out. It's like right, unbelievable. Right. Well, yeah. I do the look, I'm working overtime. Um and I know that the way I'm looking at it now, this is our like private conversation being public, but I really think it's important. Work now, I'll be able to rest later. I think that the momentum of growing this for my family, for, for everybody really to, to learn things that aren't out there, eventually one day I know I'll be able to, to rest, relax, retire. And Are you talking about when you die? When I get older. You know, I'll still be a weird nerd and loving joking, this stuff. Of course. But, uh, no, I was thinking of the verse, Derek. Blessed are the YouTubers who die in the Lord. They rest from their labors and their videos do follow them. I might have to perform a swoon act where people think I died, but I'm really nah, you don't want to continue do on. But I don't think I could let go of this stuff as long as I'm alive. I love I love diving into all of it. So well, we're creating a record. It's a wonderful record of searching and ideas. I mean, the YouTube world of the study of religion it is an amazing record. It, it's this is a new thing if you think about it. This didn't exist uh, ten years ago. How now, old are you, Doctor Tabor? How old am I? Ninety-five. <laughs> Shut up, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I already I'm know. Gonna you be like, I'm going to be like Noam, Noam Chomsky. You know, you see him all the time, and he—I think he's ninety-three, and he sounds like he's twenty, and he just—oh my god, the guy is just amazing. Right. No, I'm I'm seventy-seven. So. Seventy-seven. So I'm thirty-four now. Mm -hmm. So it, it's double my life and some. Um, one day you who are watching are going to like be like, there's that guy and I'm going to be your age talking about this material, probably as someone who's learned the languages by then who. Yeah. And you're going to go covered. years ago, there was this elderly man I worked with. Oh, we knew each other well. And he has some of the best stuff on Paul. Let me show you on my channel. So, yeah. Look at me back when I was a stud. Now I. Don't know what to say, you know. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is history we're making, and I hope that more people continue to show interest in it. And I think people really do. Well, I know I my it. colleagues have appreciated you and others who are helping them to reach that broader audience. You've mentioned Steve, and it, it's really a wonderful thing. I think one other thing I want to mention on comments: a lot of times people will say to us because we write books, they go. Oh, so pushing your book, are you? I just want to comment on that. Look, yeah, yeah. You know, here's some books I've written. Push you know, the books, James. Up, push okay. the hell out of them. So why would I not? If if I say, oh, I cover that in my book. Well, my blog is free, and it covers a lot of the stuff in the books. Right, but, right. but if I say, you know, well, get this because I tell you about the tomb in the Galilee. You know, say, so, oh, he's trying to sell his book. Look, if you spend 
five years writing a book with all of your research you put into it, it's not like you want to sell it. I mean, if people knew how little you make on books, seriously, you know, you, you don't even make a dollar on. You a need book. to be a New York Times bestseller. Even and... then, yeah, you, you don't. You know, this book sells for like, uh, let's see, I don't know anymore, but maybe well, seven, on Amazon right now. seventeen dollars, and it's my the royalties are like fifty cents or something. You know, it's not like, but so why do I want people to buy the books? Because I put into it everything that I studied for thirty years on Jesus. So. Obviously, I want you to read. We, You don't write a book in order to look at it. You write a book because you want people to read it. So, of course, scholars want people to read their books. But yeah. the, the motives are not mercenary primarily. Uh, you know, we all have ways we make a living, and I'm retired now. But the books are, uh, unless you're Dan Brown, you're not going to make a living on books, you know. But... <laughs> If you spent all of this time coming up with these things that you consider to be valuable and making a good historical cultural contribution, then of course you would want people to read it. Yeah, of course. I mean, everybody I know that even self-publishes a book, they they tell me all the time, well, Dr. Tabor, I wrote a book. Here's the PDF. Would you have time to read it? Well, I'm not going to write them back and say, well, why would I read your book? You read the book because the person is giving you something they've spent an amazing time on trying to uh, work something out, you know? Right. I, I guess I, I could use that to say about the courses. Like for me, um, usually we value things we have, we have to put effort or uh, put money into even. Um, but it's my way of drawing attention to the internet world and getting mm -hmm. academics to want to come and give their time to us here at myth vision MVP courses. So it's a way of letting the audience. So you're not just handing out like, here's a freebie. I'm just, here's some donated right. money. I'm just giving 10% to the church for the guy to stand behind the pulpit and preach. Um, you're gaining something in return by the hard work that some academic who had to spend hundreds of thousands to go get their, you know, their expertise in the field or whatever and spent 20, 30, 40 years like you have literally exhausted in this material. I think 40 or 50 years for you. You're pulling books out from the 70s. I, I, this well, is my this first book. Was, uh, let's see. It was published in 85, 86, my first book. So. But anyway, that was the, my dissertation. And I've made 73 trips to Israel. Those weren't free, you know. I mean, I mean it's just, I get it. It's funny. It, we don't need to even be, but it's worth mentioning it because some people just imagine that, like, it just, everything is just. The reason that was on my voluntary. mind, I, I did a three-part thing on Waco on Bart Ehrman's blog last week. And one person, and obviously I don't even know the person's name, but ask some question and it's complicated. Like did David Koresh take all these women and why, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, he had a certain way of whether, whether it was sincere or not a biblical reasoning about, about that, uh, his justification for polygamy and so forth. And so I said, and I have a whole chapter on that in my book. And you know what the comment back was? Oh, there you go again, trying to sell your book. It's the, what am I supposed to like repeat? Yeah. In a blog post that's limited to 200. He's unethical words. for selling a book. How dare he? No, like he's asked me a very complex question that took me over two years to figure out interviewing people, including some of David's wives and so yeah. forth trying to figure it out. And so, yeah, I put it in the book. So when I say, yeah, check the book, it's because, yeah, I put all that together for you in the book. That's you know it. what you should do from now on, Dr. Tabor? Let me know where it is, and then we'll send the hounds, mm -hmm. and the hounds will come and let them know, you're damn right he's saying by the book. I mean, you got to own it after a while. It's like, do I really speak to them and try to explain? They're not, they're not really there for you to try and explain it. They're just trying to mock or find a way to make you – pigeonhole you or, or, or poison the well or something he wants to just sell books honestly that's why i'm just shameless hey get the scholars books show them you care because that's a way that the audience like when you find out amazon is notifying you and saying hey you sold like 50 books yesterday 
Oh, I did an interview with Myth Vision yesterday. I think yeah. I'll spend more time over on Myth Vision to to, to give of them course. insight. They yeah. care about what I have done. Derek is not ashamed of saying, buy the course, buy the books, help the scholars, let them know, join their Patreon, message them, email them. That well, it's is like the old saying, all boats rise. For all of us, our knowledge yeah. rises, our opportunities rise, all our connections rise. And and all, but the main thing about a book is like, well, why would you write a book if you don't want people to read it? Imagine I wrote a book and there's one copy. Got it right here. It's fabulous. It's all my work on Jesus yeah. for 40 years. I'm not going to publish it. I like reading it. It's nice. It's my book. You'd be like, the guy is great. You know what? <laughs> He doesn't want anyone to read it. I mean, it's ridiculous. So. <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay. A, well, one more here. Uh, in Mag's okay. back again. Are you kidding me? When it comes <laughs> to understanding what you're going to believe in and arrange to life accordingly, then the value of that is priceless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think so, too. And my, look, you, you hit it exactly. Most of the people doing that are baiting you for a response or yes. they don't like your quote liberal approach and i've re redefined that in that video i put up today i give a long thing about i'm the most conservative guy you've ever heard because i'm careful with the text that's conservative i'm not a flaming liberal that just flow throws it around and acts sloppy with it i'm the one who can tell you uh, oh, Matthew took that out, or Luke added this, or whatever. And it's not like because we need more information or less. No, uh, if if they take something out, they don't like it. Believe me. And and usually you can tell what they're up to. Hmm. So I like to know what they're up to, and I don't mean it in a bad way. What is their what is their vision of Jesus? Matthew compared to Mark. So, Tim Nag, thank you for the love, everybody in here. You are wonderful for hitting the likes and just commenting and hanging out in the chat. And um, Dr. Tabor wants to hang out with you tomorrow. I pulled up the book. It's not 17. It's 1480 for the book, The Jesus Dynasty. He has several books, ladies and gentlemen, that he would love for you to read. And I would love to see <laughs> you purchase on Amazon to show you. Now, don't turn this into a commercial for my books. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one-time offer. Batteries not included. Um, you really do need to check out his books. They're on Audible as well, several of them, and I've enjoyed them. The one on Paul and Jesus, Jesus Discovery, Jesus Dynasty, interesting things. Your your angle on, on this whole thing is fun and different. It's exciting. Go to MVPCourses.com in the description his YouTube channel, go subscribe. Where he just broke 30k subscribers. You're gonna get me 10 more. I want to get to 50. Then I'm gonna rest. <laughs> I, th so, I think by five o'clock today I should have that, don't you think? What are you looking for? 50 what? I like to have 50,000 subscribers by, oh, five, yeah. by five o'clock today. In yeah. an hour, maybe. I'd give you an hour and you'll have 20 more thousand subscribers, no problem. No problem. Especially and then you with got, a two-hour video. I mean, who's not going to go for that? You gotta, you gotta go watch that. His his latest, greatest. What do we really know about Paul, and how do we know it? Who is your daddy, and what does he do? And so <laughs> you've got the uh, inside of the course here, creating Jesus. Why Mark's gospel was forgotten. Go take the course and see him Sunday for a live Zoom meeting. He's going to be covering Q&A, and we're going to be doing more courses down the road. I love you, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. I hope that this was an enjoyable stream. Any final positive, inspirational words, like buying your book or something from you, Dr. Tabor? <laughs> no, I'm okay. Uh, I just I look forward to all, this, all these things we're talking about there. I'm as excited about this as I was, you know, 50 years ago, so in my when i was a kid so okay Thank do you care. see yourself in me do you do you i see i i look at you two ways uh, let me see what is important about dr taser oh absolutely uh, yeah read that one aloud and then i'll tell you uh um, what I is look. important how, about I'm dr. tell you how i look at derek after okay I, Okay. What is important about Dr. Tabor's efforts and work with the Branch Davidian in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century Christian sects is how they may give us an insight into how Christianity developed? 
Absolutely. I have an article. It's called From Qumran to Waco. Okay. It jumps. Qumran, Dead Sea Scrolls to Waco. And I show that the fundamental things that are operating in the Dead Sea Scrolls all the way to, and I just use Waco because I was involved in that, show you how these groups work. And I'll tell you something about this preterism business because I want to do with you, Derek, I don't know if it'll be a course or extended discussions, but I, I kind of want to shut the door on that and try to show that when, when prophecy fails, one of the reactions is to say it was fulfilled. Mm. Another is to postpone it, just change the date, slide it on down. Another is to basically reinterpret all the symbols so that they lose any kind of valence or meaning so they could almost apply to anything. That's sort of what the church did. The, the beast of revelation, that's evil throughout the ages. Uh, Putin right. is the beast and the, it becomes totally ahistorical. So the predators are very historical. They're stuck in 70, right? The year 70. So very historical. But then in terms of what that really means, it, it's just, uh, and then the, I guess the typological thing would be the third one I'm talking about. The fourth is, I joke sometimes, is just saying, what the hell, I hate this stuff, I'm going to go crazy, I'm never reading any, never reading Daniel or Revelation again, because it ruined my life. I'm going to just go read like the Sermon on the Mount. And all of a sudden you realize, wait. That's more apocalyptic than Daniel and Revelation. <laughs> so, so how am I going to get out of this? Yeah, the meek but, shall inherit the earth. Well, that sounds well, like... You need to go to uh, Don Crossan because Crossan is the man for saying, okay, given all of this so-called liberal scholarship and prophecy filled and all that, are there cultural values that we can still draw from this literature? And he's learning from Schweitzer. Remember, mm -hmm. Schweitzer did not throw out the baby with the bathwater, as we say. Right. He throws out the water, but he says, you know, there's something here we need to keep. And he heads for Africa and gets his uh, MD degree. Why? Well, you know, he's it's 1906, and he's thinking about um, the example of Jesus the failed Messiah, but what he really taught in terms of a nonviolent way for humans to get together and so forth. And, hmm. and I think uh, even, even with our friend Paul, so many people hate Paul, but you know, he did write First Corinthians 13 that a lot of people use at weddings and so forth, right? About love. And he wrote things like whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are, you know, he, he can spit out some good lines here and there. But he also tells you don't get married, don't go into business, don't worry if you're a slave. Uh, God forbid you try to do a sex change if you're a man or a woman, because it's all going to be okay very quickly. And the things that Paul says would change very quickly did not change and therefore paul's not a preterist mm. Mm -mm -mm. he died without seeing it still expecting it to come but it did not happen it did not happen that's what Our, i want to get into with you too because i that's the same that's my conclusion on and it. we'll we'll even talk about nt wright who has a very sophisticated version of the same kind of thing Exactly. Yeah. And we got one more here. Eris Aurelian, any recommended order when reading the books? The books of my books? Oh, my books. Yeah. I'm yeah. I would, I would, if you're interested in Jesus, I would start with the Jesus dynasty and then do Jesus and Paul and then Paul's ascent to paradise and then the Jesus discovery which is the archaeology of the Jesus movement. And then I also have a Waco book that is on Waco. I have a book called A Noble Death that is on suicide and martyrdom, death by choice. 
which includes Masada and other things. That's an important book on, for the study of ethics. Do we have the right to choose death? Uh, it's in our culture now, we talk about assisted death, you know, and in, it's legal in Canada, not legal in the United States. Should that be the case? Is, 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 sui is it suicide if somebody chooses death in a circumstance that would be heroic uh, and so forth? So I've got that book. My translation of Genesis is always fun to, <laughs> so uh, I've got a variety of things, but my big thing coming out is uh, a year from now, The Lost Mary, How the Jewish Mother of Jesus Became the Virgin Mother of God. Well, Mother of God? Are you kidding me? Yes. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, was the tra that was the transition. The Jewish mother of Jesus uh, wasn't even a Christian. I don't think she's yeah. Jewish, and I think she—I think I can name eight of her kids. So she's not perpetually a virgin, and no married woman should be. That would be an annulment of a marriage. If a marriage isn't consummated, it's not a marriage. That's true in any culture. Yeah. You could have a partnership, but it's not a marriage. So have you ever wow. thought about that? Say, well, Mary, Mary was married to Joseph. Well, that's why Matthew says he knew her not until she had brought forth her son. Because otherwise it's not a marriage. That's yeah, a you... tough one for Roman Catholics and other theologians. But hey, anything can be explained in the interest of dogma anything that's kind of what you're uncovering here actually and and that's what this book's gonna you be know about. what i want to do is redeem the woman i love her imagine being robbed of your religion your sexuality your womanhood your children you're what you have three children right right tell ryan later ryan you're going to go down in history a hundred years from now guess what you won't have any kids you won't even be married to derek and you're going to be a what? We'll make some religion up that she wouldn't like. You'll be a Zoroastrian priest <laughs> in the temple somewhere in Iran. And she goes, that's nothing to do with me. Duh. Nothing about Mary had anything to do with her. So I'm bringing that woman home. She's coming home to her Jewish heritage where she grew up. And these extraordinary boys that she raised who changed the world. Wow. That's going to be cool. I can't wait to hear uh, what you what you bring there, Dr. Tabor. And I I don't know if I should say it, but. Uh, I, I almost had, want you to, but I'm not going no, to. No, I can't. <laughs> yeah. the, the person narrating the documentary is a household name. Don't guess. I'm not. You know me. I'm not. Yeah, I don't want you to say I'm not going back. Let's, on just, let's just say he has the voice of God. Now we got to stop right now. Okay. <laughs> We're done. Bye Ladies bye. and gentlemen, Take care. sign up for the Mark course. Get ready for more. We thank you and never forget ever. We are Myth Vision. Thank you so much, Dr. Tabor. I'll see you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. See you Sunday, some of you. See you Sunday for sure. Let me find this outro here. Where, which one do we want to go with? I'm going to do, let's do the most. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.